Hey there friends, this is Pete with BananaHobby.com. Welcome to your Ask Pete webisode. For those of you that do not know what Ask Pete webisodes are, it is basically you all out there coming onto our YouTube channel and on Facebook as well and leaving comments for me in the comment area where you have any questions in regards to radio control or anything uh, based with airplanes or whatever you want to think of with uh, radio control basically, you can ask me on the comment area here right below and I'll pick some questions, compile them, and then go ahead and answer them in an Ask Pete webisode. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, this week's Ask Pete webisode, and uh, we're just going to go ahead and start answering some of these questions. Keep in mind some of the questions that I cannot choose because uh, some, of them, some of the areas there is a very, very large topic, and uh, for those, I'll actually, I have those actually saved so that I could probably make a another like a series with it or maybe just an actual uh, how-to with those with those questions. Let's start with question number one here and it comes to us from Drift Pro and uh, this person says, hey Pete, I am a 13 year old kid from Granada and wanted to know what plane is best for just learning to fly RC. Learning to fly RC plane. I got the Mini F-18, but totally destroyed it. Okay, first of all, if you're a complete beginner, I strongly urge you to not start off with a, a EDF jet. There are a lot of airplanes on our website that are geared more towards the novice, so that if you're learning how to fly, you want to start with those. I know a lot of us, you know, the saying really holds true in just about everything we do in life. You know, you got to, pretty much you got to walk before you run. But... However, a lot, I hear a lot that, you know, people just want to get into flying an EDF jet. And I got to tell you, uh, sometimes that's not the best way to start. If you, uh, even if you're like a professional airline pilot or something like that, or a civilian pilot, flying RC is still actually very, very different. Same principles apply, but uh, you still want to start off with uh, something in the beginner category. And with that, I would say right now, on our website, the better the better trainers. You want to start off with something like the, the uh, the Sky Surfer, or the uh, I think it's called the Sky Trainer 1280. Those are all really really good. We have a couple of new free wing ones coming on site too, and uh, keep uh, keep track of those. And those are going to be really good as well. Something with a high wing, that's a uh, very docile and very stable. Um, will be a better platform to learn, and then you can actually use that airplane to progress. Okay, so thank you for that question. Next one comes up, come to us from uh, Red Wine is Fine. Actually, this person has two questions, and uh, we're going to go ahead and answer them. Let's see here. The first one says, hello, Pete. Have you ever designed, built, and flown a scratch build EDF or electric plane ever? If so, how did it work out and perform? Um, if so, the materials of choice, foam, motor, et cetera, servos, et cetera. If not, why not? Okay, this is a Good, it's a good question. Basically, um, I used when I was younger, I used to scratch build with wood a lot. But if we're talking about foam, I haven't really built any scratch built foam per se in this kind of category here. Uh, however, you know, when we are in the design phases and uh, coming out with a new product, I do work hand in hand with the manufacturers. And at that time, we were actually designing and uh, building an airplane from, uh, from the factory. Uh, but for myself, as far as scratch building, the only thing I've ever done is pretty much buying Depron foam and uh, cutting it myself into like a 3D airplane or a pusher jet or something like that and, and uh, building it that way. I haven't done anything like this by myself on my own, but I have built like the uh, profile type of 3D airplanes and things like that. And uh, foam again, you can choose uh, Depron, you can choose EPP foam. Those are all pretty much uh, available at your local hobby shops and you can actually build your own uh, Depron airplanes. Actually, you know, it's a lot of fun because you can actually design them however you choose to. Great question. Okay, the next one still comes from Red Wine is fine. And this one says, uh, Hello Pete, you have a few gyro assisted EDF jets on your website. Do you have a gyro or that one available for other planes or jets on your website? If so, how would you install it, per se, on an A-10 or even a P-51 as examples? Okay. For those that have not watched it, there 
all of our 50 millimeter jets on our website now, the, under the Backpack Jet Series, actually come with a two axis gyro. And the benefit of the two axis gyro is if you're learning how to fly a jet, it actually keeps the platform extremely stable. Uh, when you actually move the airplane back and forth, the ailerons will counter, and then the elevator, when you pitch it forward and backwards, the, the elevator would actually counter. So it actually would, when you're flying, especially in wind, it's, al it's always keeping the airplane extremely flat. And to answer the question, that the gyro that we're talking about, we actually sell it on our website. And uh, just a two-access gyro, and it comes with the instructions on how to mount it. If you want more instructions on it, you can actually watch the F-35 backpack jet video with the two-axis gyro. I actually talk about the, the way to mount it in there as well. And if you go to our website and you get that little gyro, the two-axis gyro here, you can mount that pretty much in any airplane you choose to. You want to mount it in, a, you know, in an A-10 or a P-51, whatever you want to mount it on, because it's basically it's a two-axis. You want to keep it on your elevator and on your aileron. And this will actually benefit every airplane out there if you choose to uh, add it to it. I was just thinking about the idea just the other day of actually mounting on, on, uh, on one of the Warbirds and just seeing how it performs. Um, I can only tell, I can already tell it's going to actually benefit if you uh, like anything else. It's pretty much, it's very similar to what E-Flight has, which is the AS3X system in all of the UM, UMX airplanes. And I have quite a few of those little UMX uh, AS3X airplanes. And uh, they fly just, they fly really, really well, especially in wind, because it's, count, it's constantly countering what the wind is actually pushing the airplane around. It's actually fixing that, so it makes it fly very, very smooth. So, great question. Okay, let's move on to the next question here. Let's see. It says, uh, Pete, I'm new to electric power. Where, where can I find some reference material on how to hook up all the components together? I found pictographs and... Uh, and do this if, if, if it don't work. I'm an aircraft mechanic with uh, avionics degree and still can't figure it out. Thanks in advance. Dave. And this comes to us from AVS or AV Stud 09. What basically you're looking for on how to hook up components, your best source of information right now, if, you need, if you're looking for that kind of information, is to just basically search it online uh, and uh, search it on YouTube. There are several videos out there on how to actually plug everything in, where everything needs to be plugged into. And if you follow some of the videos on, um, on our YouTube channel, I actually go through a lot of that on how to actually set up certain things, certain airplanes, uh, where to plug things into, and that sort of thing. Um, I think YouTube is your best source of uh, information right now. If you need to find any of that, go ahead and, like, if you're trying to plug in servos, just type it in and uh, in the search area and uh, these uh, videos would actually pop up. So great question there. Let's go on to the next one here. This comes to us from Smooth Cruiser 37 and it says, Pete, I have a comment or tip for the new pilot that purchases FMS Blitz RC airplanes. Uh, I see this on RC groups and other forums. Banana Hobby most likely has a lot of calls or complaints about the ESC throttle not working when they first hook up their radio, when they first hook up their LiPo battery. Please explain and tell pilots that the throttle range must be calibrated first be before they uh, will get full range of power. Your friend, Smooth Cruiser. Thank you, Smooth Cruiser. I actually made a video on exactly how to calibrate uh, FMS throttle calibration. So please check out that video as well. What this person is saying, what Smooth Cruiser is saying is, if you purchase any of the FMS Warbirds right now, or even the EDF jets, the throttle endpoint needs to be calibrated. And a lot of people are getting this issue where when you first plug everything in, once you have everything built or not built yet, and you're checking your electronics, you plug everything in, your motor is not making any beeping sounds whatsoever. And then you go to throttle on your, on your radio, and there's no throttle movement. So that means that the motor's not moving. And what you have to do is called throttle calibration. So what that does is it'll read the low point of your throttle stick and then the high point of your throttle stick. So all of, just about all of the uh, FMS larger, I, I believe like 1,000 millimeters and above, most, of, most all of them will need to have the throttle endpoint calibrated. And there is a video that I made on how to calibrate it, but I will talk about it really briefly here. When you go to plug it in, 
before you plug in the LiPo to your airplane, you want to have uh, your radio on, and then you want to set your throttle stick to the full, full up, full throttle position. And then go ahead and plug in the battery to the, uh, your airplane. And once you do that, you'll hear, you, you want to wait about two seconds, and you'll hear two quick initializing beeps. As soon as you hear those two quick initializing beeps, you lower your throttle stick to the all the way down low position. And then you'll hear two more initializing beeps. After you do that, turn everything off, and then uh, power on as normal. Turn on your transmitter, plug, in t plug your LiPo into your airplane, and uh, you will have initializing beeps saying that it recognizes the, uh, the radio throttle set, the throttle endpoints there, and uh, you're calibrated and you're ready to go. So that's a good question, and I know that we've been getting quite a few calls, and that's why I did make that video. So please watch that video as well. Thank you for that question. Okay, next question comes to us from Jim. It's Jim801961. And Jim asks, let's see here, are the backpack jacks with the gyros installed turning into the new trainer? And are the four channel radios that we carry with the ARFs on the website good enough for backpack jets, gyros, programming, etc.? Uh, Jim, well, basically, I talked briefly above about the two axis gyros. And it is a new trainer because a lot of people are having uh, difficulties transitioning from certain airplanes into jets because jets, flying EDF jets in general is a different nature than flying something with a propeller on it. And I like it because uh, it, it's very, very forgiving on people that are learning, especially the backpack jets because you have to hand launch it. And a lot of times I hear a lot when uh, our patrons are hand launching, they you know, they, they uh, don't throw it in the correct angle or something happens and it nose dives and, you know, that kind of a situation. And they, the, ax the two axis gyros in the backpack jets will actually minimize that quite a bit. When you throw it, it just leaves nice and flat because the control surfaces are actually uh, helping it to stay really, really stable and level. And uh, the radios that we carry, they're great. They're basically, they're all 2.4 gigahertz now. And uh, I've yet to have any issues with range or anything like that, especially with the FMS stuff. The uh, radios actually work out really, really well. I, don't, I wouldn't worry about that at all. And there is not really any programming as far as the radio is concerned with the, the uh, gyros that are going in the backpack jets. Those are to be tuned on the gyros themselves. So uh, that, that portion of it is on the F-35 video. So please check that out. Thank you for that question. OK, let's see here. Next one comes to us from John, and the username is JCHTR3AC. And John asks, these are great. They cover a wide spectrum of enthusiasts, of new enthusiasts to those who are more experienced. When I see accessories advertised, but first of all, thank you. Uh, that's what I gear towards when I'm making these videos. I want to make sure that everybody is uh, knowledgeable, and the more that they watch these, the more you can learn about what uh, you know, RC is about or questions that you may have and stuff like that and uh, I could possibly answer. So that's the key purpose is to you know, help everybody. So I'm glad you like it. Uh, so thank you. So let's, the question is, when I see accessories advertised, say retracts, it will usually give me a number like 120 size model. What does that number mean and where does it come from? And that is a great question. If you are new into uh, hobby, this hobby, RC radio control flying, you will see this number a lot. And basically what that number is, they actually came about from uh, the earlier times when everybody would fly nitro fuel airplanes. Um, I mean, we still fly it. A lot of people still fly it. And the number means this, we're, we're talking about usually the motor size. And when you talk about nitro fuel powered, nitro methane fuel powered engines, they come in sizes of 10, 15, 20, 25, uh, usually from 25 we skip over to 40, and then 45 to 50 to 60 size, and then um, 80 size, and then 120 size. Usually when it becomes a 120 size, we're most likely talking about uh, like a four stroke, and that talks about the, it's like a general rule of thumb of an oversight, like what size the airplane is. I know it gets a little bit confusing, but the, uh, you can look up a couple of engine companies out there like uh, OS engines. They make, uh, they're, they're one of the tr most trustworthy engines that I've ever flown. And then there's YS engines. They're still around. I think they're still around. And then uh, there's Sato. 
So these numbers all pertain to the size of the engines. And usually that size of the engine will tell you just about how big the airplane is. Um, when you say 120 size, usually it's a pretty large aircraft. And then nowadays, the uh, gas engines are so popular now that you know, a lot of people are actually just going to fly gasoline because it's a lot cheaper. The fuel cost is a lot cheaper. Uh, nitromethane has really ri risen in the, uh, the fuel cost, so a lot of people are flying the smaller gasoline engines now. So great question. Next question is uh, from one is Khan, and uh, he's referring or she's referring to uh, Pete. Is the canopy on the new ME two sixty two being changed to the right shape? Uh, good picking that out. I'm. She, this person is talking about my previous uh, webisode where I had an ME two sixty two in front of me, and the the first thing that we took about we talked about there is that I had feedback from everybody that likes the uh, models and stuff. And that said, the ME262, the, the canopy shape is wrong. And we listened to everybody. We listened to y'all. And we actually contacted the manufacturers, manufacturer. And we have revised the canopy. So we're, we have an actual ME262 here now that I will be doing a build review on, which uh, we fixed. We revised the canopy to the correct shape. So thank you for that question. And we did do that. And, uh, and overall, let's see. Uh, OK, the next question here is from Master Chief 586. And this person asks, what happened to the sliding canopy, Pete? You didn't, or, or you didn't so, or you didn't use it, or it really doesn't have one, which is it? OK, basically, this person's saying, it, in my build video for the P51 version 7 1400 millimeter, I didn't slide the canopy back. They do have sliding canopies. You can see them in the photos. Um, all, this, all the V version 7 1400 pi 1400 millimeter P51s all have sliding canopies. So you can actually mechanically use your hand and slide them back and then close them. So uh, no worries there. They, they actually do slide open. I just didn't do it in the build, the build video, that's all. OK, one general question that I hear a lot of from, from uh, all you is that when I'm flying at my local field, you uh, hear all these popping sounds. Uh, some say it sounds like a tennis match going on in the background. Uh, some say it sounds like, you know, pop. They're just basically popping sounds. Let me tell you what that is so everybody can understand. I wish there was no popping sounds. However, it is a public park. And to the right side of our main runway is actually a small caliber, small caliber pistol and rifle range, 22 caliber. So you hear a lot of popping sounds coming from there. But the majority of the large popping sounds come from our, the left side of, the, of our main runway. And it's across the freeway. And what it is, it's a skeet range. And uh, guys over there with big high power shotguns are shooting clay pigeons, or skeet shooting, basically. So that's what you're hearing. So that's a gun range over there. And then it's a gun range on our right side, too. That's why you see on our main wall, it says, do not fly over rifle range. And the reason why that is there is because sometimes when you fly over that rifle range and you have a problem, it's potentially dangerous because your airplane could actually hit somebody in the rifle range. So we're, we're we have to fly far uh, to the left of the rifle range. But anyway, so that's what the popping sound is. A lot of people were asking about that, didn't know what it is. So hopefully now you can understand why there's these uh, crackling popping sounds in the background. Once again, my name is Pete. Thank you very much for uh, checking out these Ask Pete webisodes. By all means, if you have any questions for me, it doesn't even really matter what it is. And I, to me, there are no no stupid questions, no dumb questions whatsoever. If you have a question in regards to RC, go ahead and post them up on the comments box right below here. And I'll go ahead and go through them and compile some questions and come up with another Ask Pete webisode where I may just pick your question and answer it on, uh, on YouTube here. Once again, thank you. Love to have you all follow us on Twitter and uh, like us on Facebook and subscribe here as well. We will see you next time with another Ask Pete webisode.